So this is the MBQC session. So if you want to see contextuality, you need to run away now. Um, first up, we have um, Philippa Perez talking about quantum circuit compilation uh, and hybrid computation using Pali-based computation. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I ask for your patience. I'm going to keep my mask on, but if anyone's having a trouble understanding or hearing, let me know. Maybe I can speak up a little or approach the mic. I don't know. And second, I want to thank the organization for putting together this amazing conference. It has been an awesome experience. So this is only my um, the second year of my PhD. So this is my first big international conference. And speaking here is uh, very exciting. So I can't wait to, to show you what, uh, what we've been working uh, on. So let's just start with um, a brief presentation overview. I'm going to start with some motivation and preliminary concepts, but I'm, I'm going to fly by this because most of it has either already been talked or I think most of you will be, from, will be familiar with. And then we get into the really juicy stuff, which is um, poly-based computation. And since this is the MBQC session, I think uh, it will come as no surprise that this is an MBQC uh, model. And um, then I will show you how to use this model to perform circuit compilation. And uh, finally, I will address hybrid computation and I'll comment a little bit more about this, this term hybrid that I'm using um, in due time. So just as a, as a brief motivation, as you know, current quantum hardware is sort of limited in its capabilities and so we aren't quite ready to or quite able to achieve quantum advantage um, with current devices for practical applications. And this is why hybrid techniques have sort of gained some traction re recently. And most of you uh, will have heard about variational quantum algorithms such as VQE and QAOA. And this is sort of where my work fits in. So uh, focus on hybrid techniques for quantum classical computation. Okay, now let's fly by this. I'll talk a lot about poly operators, and these are just tensor products of single qubit polys, X, Y, and Z. Uh, the poly group has two N generators, which you can write as X and Z operators. And then there's the Clifford group, and Clifford unitaries are just unitaries that map polys into polys under conjugation, and you can do this efficiently. And for instance, you can show how uh, the generators of the, the poly group are mapped under conjugation by the generators of the Clifford group. So for instance, the Hadamard maps X into Z and Z into X, and you can do the same for, for the phase gate and for, for the C naught, um, yeah, which are the other two generators for the Clifford group. And uh, we also know that if we introduce any non-Clifford gate, then we unlock universal quantum computation. And in particular, in this presentation, I'll talk a lot about the, the T gate. And the final concept is just the concept of magic state injection. And in particular, I'll talk a little bit about the A state. I apologize for the image I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, then uh, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with this idea that if you have a T gate, you can just replace it by this um, well-known T gadget where you bring in a resource state, which is a magic state, and you just have Clifford gates, and you need classical feed forward to determine whether or not you apply an S gate or, or not. And then you will have uh, enacted a transformation that's basically a T gate on, on the main qubit. And this concludes everything that you'll need to know to follow this presentation. So let's get into the, the interesting part. So. In 2000, 2016, uh, Bravi, Smith, and Smolin um, published this paper here, where there's a theorem that says that if you have a Clifford plus T circuit with n input qubits, T, T gates, and a certain number of final Z measurements, you can simulate this by what they call the poly-based computation. Here I call it that calligraphic Q. And what's the structure of this um, poly-based computation, basically? You have as input a product state of magic states, but you have T qubits. So you don't have N qubits anymore, you have T, where T is the number of T gates in your original circuit. Okay? And then what are the operations? Well, again, this is the MBQC session, so the operations are measurements. Uh, 
but what kind of measurements? These are measurements of t qubit poly operators. And uh, I will prove that these are at most t measurements of poly operators. And moreover, these operators um, are pairwise commuting and are independent. Okay, so this is this is the structure of this poly-based computation. And I'm gonna try to convince you uh, in a visual way that this, this is true very, very quickly. Okay, so step one, we have our quantum circuit, our Clifford plus T circuit with a certain number of final measurements. First step is use the T gadget that I introduced before. And we transform uh, every T gate into a T gadget. So now we have an adaptive Clifford circuit and we have T intermediate measurements hidden somewhere inside that inside that circuit, okay? This is step one. Step two. Step two is use the other concept that I introduced, which is this idea that you can conjugate polys by Cliffords in an efficient way. And so you take the measurements that you have from the first gadget and you push it to the very beginning of the circuit and it will show up in the beginning as a poly operator on n plus t qubits. And this is P1 prime that I, that I called here, okay? So you just push it to the very beginning and now, in principle, you would have to measure this, this operator. That's not what we're going to do yet. So what we do now is we have this operator at the beginning, and we just insert some dummy operators. So, uh, that are basically Z operators acting on the qubits of the stabilize, stabilizer register. These, these do nothing, right? So it's just Z on zero. Um, and now we realize that there are two options. So this poly that has just shown up here, either anti-commutes with, with previous polys. And if it anti-commutes with previously measured polys, then it's easy to understand that the probability of getting zero and one is just 50-50. And so instead of measuring, we can just point, uh, make a coin toss to find out what the outcome of the measurement would be. So we do that, we make a coin toss and find out what the outcome is, and we just drop the poly. We don't need to measure it in our quantum hardware. And instead, put a Clifford unitary in its place, which is the, Clif uh, the, the unitary that prepares the state that we would have gotten had we done the measurement, right? Because we need to prepare the, the correct state. And the point is that this unitary is Clifford. That's an important point because it doesn't ruin the propagation of everything else that we'll need to propagate after, after this. There's a second option. And the second option is that the poly commutes with everything that has come before. And if that's the case, then we have again options. The first option that is that it depends on previously measured polys. And if it depends on previously measured polys, then we know the outcome or we can determine it classically. And so again, we don't need to do the measurement in the quantum hardware. We can just determine it classically. And then there's the final part, which is that it can commute and be independent. And that's when we need our quantum hardware. That's when we actually need to do the measurement because uh, it's not trivial what, what happens then. Uh, but I promised you that you would have to measure only things on the, on the magic register, right? And here you have this, this big poly. Um, but the point is that if it commutes with all previous operators, it, it's necessarily trivial on the stabilizer register. It's either identity or Z, and you can just drop what happens there. And so you can just, in your quantum hardware, measure P1, where P1 is just the bottom part of the, the poly. And then you do this for all the measurements that you have in your, in your quantum circuit. This is just the example for the first. And some will be classically dealt with, and some you'll have to measure, and another measurement will show up, and so on. And this is how you do the, the computation. Okay. Right, so this hopefully convinced you that you can simulate any any Clifford plus C circuit in this way. Um, and now I think um, most people are familiar with quantum circuits, not this. This is, can be sort of confusing. And so what we thought was, uh, how can we map this back to circuits now that we have something that, that has this structure? And in 2019, there's this, this paper here whose main goal is not this one at all, but they, they have a, re, uh, a theorem in there that they call the extended Gerzman Neal theorem, which is basically this idea that if you have an adaptive circuit like the one you see on the left, you can just transform it into an adaptive circuit like the one you see on the right, where you just have the magic register. 
And they, they explain this in light of what I just showed you, that you can go to PVC, reduce this to something that acts only on the magic part, and then come back to circuit. And they um, mentioned, this is not the main goal of, of the paper, so this is just mentioned, that you can do this with T cubed over log T operations. And so the, the first thing we did in, uh, in our work was find a different way and maybe I'll argue, uh, maybe arguably more, more intuitive, but at least I think it's more intuitive to kind of open these black boxes, how, how to do this, these Pauli measurements. And we propose something like this. So we have a certain Pauli operator that's just a tensor product of single qubit polys. And the way to measure such operator is just, we need to bring in an auxiliary qubit in the plus state and then just do controlled operations on the appropriate main qubits and then measure and so on. So this is, this is how we propose to, to do this, this comeback to, to circuits. And if you do this, you need order um, T squared operations and also depth. And so we took this a step further and we wanted to illustrate that this actually works and that uh, we can get interesting results with this. And so um, we wrote Python code to do this. And now I'm gonna show you some results. So the first, the first circuits that, that we used are hidden shift circuits. So are kind of neat because they're deterministic. We know what the outcome is, so we can test that everything's working okay. And um, here you see uh, what we call classical runtime for shot. Okay, so what's this time? This is basically the time, the, the, the time it takes you to do all the classical processing associated with, with this procedure that I just explained to you. And uh, you will notice that while you're sort of, so we call this the compilation, while you're compiling, you're also sort of already simulating the main qubit because you're already deciding the first measurement is zero, the, the other one is one. So the two processes, you cannot uh, separate them. They're, they're completely interleaved and there's no way of uh, separating the two. So this is sort of the time of each compilation or weak simulation or whatever you want to call it. Um, so you see that it's of the, hard, the order of the hundreds milliseconds, which is not great, but it's Python code, so could be much better if someone else uh, wants to implement this uh, in, the, in a different language or, or something. Uh, but now the really interesting thing, so uh, not so much worried about the classical time, but the, the features and how, how they change. So, and here you can see the depth, and in particular in green, you see the depth of the, of the original circuits. Uh, hidden shift and the x axis is the number of qubits in the original circuit and in this case the t count is fixed to 14 okay so and what uh, you see in uh, orange or yellow or whatever that color is um, is we try to do some pre-compilation with some Qiskit tools and you see that there's some reduction but then what what you see is that our what we call pvc compiled circuits have a depth that's much lower than than the original ones and we were quite happy with this, with this result. And you can make similar plots for, um, for a single qubit gate count. And again, you can see uh, an, a great drop from the original circuits to the, to the PVC compiled ones. And the same for the C0 count. Okay, but this is, this is for hidden shift circuits. And then we decided to do the same for random quantum circuits. And again, you see <coughs> that the time is more or less the same, same order of magnitude. And here for complementarity, we fix the number of qubits in the original circuit to 25 and instead vary the T count. So here the notice that the X axis has changed and now it's the, it's the T count. And you will see something a little different. So now the, the original circuits uh, again are in green, but you see that um, our PVC compiled circuits kind of become deeper uh, around 10 uh, T gates, but yeah, I can sort of, I could have sort of, if I wanted, manipulated the, the position of the green crosses because I could have just added more layers without adding more T gates and that would go up or down. So this is, uh, you can take this with a, with a grain of salt. So, uh, and here the single qubit gate count, you can see that although the depth is larger, we still have fewer gates. Um, and similar with the C0, although in 22, you can see that we already sort of looks like if we had continued, we would have more, more T counts than 
more sin sorry more synod counts than the, the original circuit. Okay, and now I just want to go to the last part, which is this task two that I called hybrid computation, and I promised to comment a little bit about this term hybrid. And this is this is important, which is the following. I think you will agree that this first task that I already um, talked to you about is already hybrid in the sense that we are already using the classical computer to do part of the processing. And we are already offloading uh, some of the some of the cost to, to a classical machine. So here the term hybrid is used in a slightly different way. And it's in the sense that you have a computation on n plus k qubits, but your hardware only has n qubits. And how can we sort of get rid of these qubits, these k qubits that we have uh, too many? And this is sort of a na natural in poly-based computation. It's very, very easy to do. And the idea is we have a big poly-based computation that, again, I call Q. And now the task is going to be slightly different. So we want, for, for instance, to get the probability of getting the outcome one, uh, of measuring the outcome one. So for instance, we want to solve a decision problem or something like that, like that and we want to have an estimate for this, for this probability. And we have n plus k qubits, but we need to get rid of the top ones that I marked red. And so what we do this, is we kind of decompose the magic state into stabilizer states. Uh, and it will be something that looks like this. And because these are stabilizer states, you can always produce them from the ground state using a, a Clifford unitary, which I call U sub i. And now what you have is basically you have decomposed your large uh, poly-based computation Q into uh, M. So the sum was, oops, sorry, the sum was in M. So you have decomposed it into M different poly-based computations that now have the zero state on the first k qubits. And similar to what we saw in the beginning of this presentation, you will sort of be able to get rid of what happens in the stabilizer register. And you only have to measure the operators in the bottom part. And so you have sort of naturally got rid of the, the, the k qubits that, that you had that didn't fit in your, in your quantum hardware. And basically, you can define some unbiased estimators for the probability of the small uh, poly-based computations giving one. And this is just that B sub i, which is the outcome of the poly-based computation, either 0 or 1. And you can show that this is an unbiased estimator for the probability. And then by linearity, basically, the probability of the big uh, poly-based computation is just a uh, summing uh, with the appropriate weights. And again, we coded this. And here, uh, again, the results first for hidden shift. And we knew the, so here you can see the, the bit string that we were supposed to get. And hopefully, you can see that there's some magenta diamonds that always get the correct result. And this was for a precision of 0 0.1. You can see some green confidence intervals here. And uh, for one virtual qubit, we did the same for two virtual qubits, three four, and the results were always uh, the ones that we would expect. And then we did the same for random quantum circuits. Here, instead of changing the, the number of virtual qubits, I just chose to show you what happens if you have, um, if you choose different precisions, and it's just the confidence interval gets, gets narrower, okay? And uh, yeah, so to conclude, basically, I think that what I hope you got from this is that this poly-based computation seems to be a promising tool in terms of circuit compilation and hybrid computation. And if you're curious about this, you can check out the archive or the code that we shared on GitHub, or you can corner me uh, in the lunch break and or the coffee break. I'm easy to spot. I'm the, the alien in the green mask, basically. And um, yeah, I think that's it. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Um, so I think you had a slide somewhere that I'm directly comparing um, sort of your compilation to um, what QuizKit would do naturally. Yeah, I just, uh, right, I just did some, uh, it was not very advanced stuff. I just used the transpiler and asked it to, to sort of try to minimize some gates and stuff like that. And he did, oops, sorry, I already went too far. And he did 
give me the 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 yellow things but like maybe maybe their tool could work a little better i didn't try to like really hone it very very deeply but yeah, yeah um... i i just used their transpiler and i told it that it should um use the same gate set like it it was forbidden from changing gates or something like that because that would be an unfair comparison and that's that's what Kiskit gave me but this was just uh instead of Kiskit we could, could have used something different uh, yeah compare. and, and Kiskit does have have certain limitations um it's doing the best optimizing routines but I was just wondering sort of is this sort of um because you're using different operations like you're using a lot of measurement in the circuit right um so is this a sort of direct so what in in the end what we have are circuits that look like this. So you have uh, measurements inside the circuit, yeah, the 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 the, the auxiliary qubit. You have to measure it to get the outcome of each poly, mm -hmm. uh, and then you reset it. Of course, you could have just had more auxiliary qubits and measure each and have them die after the measurement, but that's not very very um, yeah useful. Or you're increasing the number of qubits unnecessarily. But this is basically how our circuits look like. So these are just control gates and Hadamards, and that's it. Uh, plus, plus the measurements at the end. Um, plus, the me plus the measurements after after it, yeah. And yeah. are you counting those as gates in those pots, or? Uh, good question. Uh, I don't remember, but um, in this plot, even if there aren't any measurements, you would raise the, the, the dots by 14 because that's the number of measurements at most that you have. And 14 is nothing in this, in this kind of scale. So, but uh, yeah, I don't the recall if I counted the, the measurements uh, as gates, I would have to, to check yeah, the, the measurements can be expensive themselves in you know, current hardware, but. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. But in terms of just counting here, uh, yeah. it, it would just be raising this by, by 14. Each, yeah, uh, kind for of. sure. Have you considered combining your techniques with ones for T count reduction? Because presumably that's kind of another yeah, optimization uh, that would work well here. Yeah, so uh, because of that, I kind of started reading all the ZX calculus papers. And yeah, there's this one paper that uh, specifically addresses this. And so that would be an interesting thing, like start first with something like that, that reduces the T count and then doing this, because then it will drop the, 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 the things even more because the lower the T count, the better. But but yeah, uh, that's uh, something that makes sense to do, no doubt. What does the dashed red line uh, mean here? Uh, okay, bound? so um, we um, derived some upper bounds for the depth and the gate counts uh, in our paper, and these are basically the the deeper you could the deeper circuits you could have and this assumes that all your polys are non-trivial so they never have identities in your polys and so these are really gross overestimates and here in this uh, in these graphics you just see that uh, very very clearly like you're assuming that all polys are non-trivial and you always have identities and so yeah that's that's what you're seeing there and here it's horizontal because the t count is is constant here. I told I told you it was fourteen, and in the random quantum circuits you see that uh, it's uh, it's uh, t squared, so it goes with t squared. So that's why you have here the parabola, and yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Have you thought about the problem of extracting a unitary circuit? from a from a PBC to go so to go fully back to a circuit with no internal measurements uh no we didn't think about that hmm yeah that that's something that we could think about I'm not sure how it would work because you kind of need as soon as you put the T gadgets in and you start propagating things you kind of need the outcome of this one to get the other poly, but uh, so I'm not sure how that would work, but that's something we could maybe think about, but I'm not sure how, how it could or whether it could even be possible or not. Thanks. Um, okay, let's move on. Thank the speaker again. Uh, okay, so next up we have Aiden Evans uh, talking about Macbeth. 
a measurement-based quantum programming language. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Alex just said, my name is Aiden, and I'm going to be talking about Macbeth, which my colleagues Shannon Mona J, Robert Soule, and Robert Rand and I have all been working on. To get us started, I'm going to first talk about NISC versus non-NISC languages. Namely, there exist uh, many quantum languages, and these fall into two categories. First one being NISC languages, such as OpenCASM, and they describe a circuit, very low level representation. They're also quite tedious to program in. Uh, for example, here we have a circuit for our standard uh, teleportation. And we have a Hadamard, a couple C knots, another Hadamard. It's very verbose. And it's also not clear just at first glance, especially for someone just getting started with quantum programming, that this actually entangles these three qubits together. Uh, a downside of NISC language are good yet, they are runnable in practice. <laughs> Uh, but now we also have non-NISC languages, such as QSharp and Silk. These describe an algorithm at a higher level, and they're also easier to read and write. Yet the downside of these is that they are not runnable on existing devices. We want the best of both worlds, and that is what we aim Macbeth to be, something to bridge the gap between NISC and non-NISC languages. So Macbeth being measurement based, it is specifically based on the measurement calculus, which is a general model for MBQC proposed by Danos et al. And it captures the intuition of the quantum operations, the actual operations of the measurement calculus reflect well entanglement measurement and our standard poly corrections. It's also feasible to run on quantum hardware. Measurement calculus programs have three stages and entanglement, which creates a cluster state measurement of these qubits and different bases specified by what's called a measurement angle, angle of measurement, and finally the poly corrections, namely X and Z. There's also a high level J operator, which takes in angle of measurement as input, and this is used for program composition, namely take, you take two qubits, it entangles them together, Here's the first one, and then corrects the second one based on the, the measurement outcome of the first. And however, the measurement calculus is currently only existed on paper, uh, and that's where Macbeth comes in. So Macbeth is a realization and is it aimed to realize and extend the measurement calculus for practical quantum programming, actually provide a tool for your users to work in and run simulations in, not just think about it purely in terms of a theoretical framework. So you can program using the J operator as is defined above and a control Z. You can uh, create these programs graphically as many uh, cluster state computations are. And then, you ought, then we provide a framework to automatically compile these down into a three stage form following the rewriting rules of the measurement calculus. This then puts you in the form where you have the entanglement measurement correction mentioned before. We also are working on extending the J operator. So currently the J operator only works between two qubits. Uh, we're working on generalizing it so that you may be able to measure and correct two qubits as opposed to just measuring and correcting one. I'll talk a little bit briefly about that at the very, very end. Uh, yep, last multiple cases being entangled. And we also have some implementations of some key quantum algorithms and provide uh, the ability to simulate uh, weak and strong simulations of them. So to go into the benefits here is uh, the fact that Macbeth is a bit more intuitive to work with, at least. So as displayed here, we have the gate-based model, which was already mentioned before. And in Macbeth, this is teleportation is represented quite simply. We have this three qubits here three qubit cluster. And to actually write out the program, we just take these two J operators and set the angle of measurement to zero. So compared to the gate model here, which is the standard one typically taught, uh, we have only these two, two of the same operator as opposed to what is displayed on the left there. Now, to discuss a little bit more about the representation here, any three qubit cluster when represented with these J operators has the following effect on the qubits. 
So this is implementing essentially a Z rotation and X rotation such that the second qubit, Q2, is, is equals the result of applying these two rotations to the first qubit. Now, again, because in teleportation we, want this, we don't want the uh, state to change at all, we simply set the angle of measurements to zero and we get the identity. In Macbeth, we represent this as follows. So we start off with declaring what our qubits are. So we say that Q0 is our input qubit, and then we say that Q1 and Q2 are to simply be prepared in the plus state, in other words, non-input qubits. And then we write down the two j's. So the 0, 0.0 there is representing the angle of measurement, and then the 0, 1 and the 1, 2 are representing the application of the j operator. Now, because the j operator can be rewritten as follows, this is how it's defined, entanglement measurement correction, the automatic decompilation uh, of the program to lower level commands and standardization, which puts it in this three-phase form, will then give you the entanglement measurement and correction. Uh, notably, uh, something to point out is the brackets there and the measurement and the poly corrections represent dependencies or signals. In other words, uh, the operations that are dependent on the measurement outcome of earlier qubits. Now, another benefit is scalability. So with Macbeth, you have very nice ability to construct distributed programs. You can have specialized nodes, tangling node, measurement nodes, and even in some cases, if you wish, correction nodes. And with these, you can distribute the compute uh, qubits initially from a central entangling node. You then share the measurement outcomes classically amongst the computation, the other remaining computers. And this overall allows you to decrease the number of qubits per computer. So if you have a 100 qubit computation, you can distribute amongst 10 computers, and each one only needs to handle 10 qubits. Or really, if you wanted to take it to the extreme, have one qubit per computer. <laughs> uh, therefore, this allows for scalable quantum computing. So. Some future directions we're working on is the universality of this generalized J operator, namely the generalized J operator here. Uh, it allows one to take that first qubit, right, measure it and correct two more. We found that this actually results in those two qubits being left over, being left in a maximally entangled state. Now, the J operator alone will represent your single qubit unitaries. So taking the J operator and combining it with your CZ is universal. That is something that we that's already been known. Now we believe that this generalized J operator may as well be universal because it can, well, also entangle our leftover qubits. Uh, other directions involve running Macbeth programs on MVQC hardware, as well as a tool for the diagrammatic construction of programs. As already mentioned, we can construct programs in that grid-like fashion, and actually the generalized J operator, if it is universal, as we believe, that would then allow any quantum program to be represented as an acyclic directed graph. Uh, very nicely, where each node is corresponds to a physical qubit, and the directed edges represent the application of the general generalized J. So with that, uh, we have a preprint available if you would like to take a look as well as our code base containing some examples from the paper. And if you have any questions after this, of course, you can find me. Uh, feel free to email uh, myself or Ann Shane. Thank you. Yeah, so as I understand it, you have these um, simple J's, mm -hmm. which I'm guessing underlying this is some notion of causal flow, which allows you to label the edges of the graph with the J operations. Is this correct? Uh, so I should say that I'm not as familiar with causality, but to my understanding, it does uh, create like a temporal ordering of the computation. Right. But so when you go to these generalized J operations, mm -hmm. you no longer have access to, well, you can no longer as straightforwardly label the edges of the underlying graph with the J operations or with the flow, I think it's equivalent for the causal case. Do you know how this is going to work for the, the generalized J operations, which I guess is like a G flow? Yes, so the generalized J operator, uh, you're correct that you can't just simply take the simple J and label them, especially when you're going from one to many. 
but uh, we're currently looking at just a simple generalization where it will entangle the qubits first in like a like a one here, and then you entangle like that. Uh, measure this one and then correct. Uh, yeah, well, like I said, we're still looking into it, so we may end up finding that you know changing it slightly, maybe have different X, uh, poly corrections at the end might work for a better generalization. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. At the beginning, you said something I found a little bit confusing. So when you talk about runnable or not runnable, what did, what did you intend by that? Uh, what I intended by that was uh, actually having, well, one, the ability to easily run on current hardware. Certain languages don't have a, the actual ability to compile, compi uh, compile down to the gates that would actually end up running on the computers. Is that makes sense. Yeah, but I think all languages can compile down to the theoretically, anything. yes. Uh, yeah, Silk, for instance, is just a simulator. It doesn't spit yeah. out circuits. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm slightly confused about this three-stage process that you mentioned with the corrections all coming at the end, because it sounds like you're doing corrections on qubits which are being measured, and then you have to do the correction before you do the measurement, right? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the underlying framework the measurement calculus does allow one to take, uh, rewrite the program in such a way where all the corrections can come at the very end uh, on the qubits that are left over non-measured qubits. So you're right where we're, you may have like an uh, entanglement measurement correction and then some more going on after such as that qubit that was being used before being measured on, it'll just get rid of the correction and merges it and using rewriting rules. So uh, there are no corrections on the measured qubits. Right, so it incorporates that into, like it adapts the measurement angle accordingly. Yes, it, it modifies the measurement angle. Right, okay, yep. thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just somewhat confused about the J operator. Maybe I'm misunderstanding everything. But are you just assuming that every measurement gives the undesired outcome because you correct you you measure and then you correct if you get the undesired outcome on your measurement? But you're always applying a correction, and it doesn't really make sense to me. Yes, sorry. Uh, I should have specified that the uh, corrections are dependent. So in some cases, you may not actually perform the correction. Sure. Okay. Thanks for the talk. So you uh, you gave a nice presentation of how teleportation looks a little bit simpler, but in contrasting how verbose a program would be in uh, Macbeth versus, say, Open Chasm, uh, what sort of difference would you see for something like an addition circuit? Would you see a substantial difference in how complicated the programs look? Well, we haven't looked into addition specifically, uh, but we can yeah, say for, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for, uh, for example, Deutsch Josa, or uh, Rather, Grover is perhaps a better example here. Two qubit Grover, the actual oracle is just simply changing the angles of measurement, while the structure of the qubit underlying physical qubits stay the same, uh, which is one benefit. Uh, for Deutsch Josa, it's didn't see too much benefit, but again, there may be ways that we didn't haven't looked at yet to actually simplify things. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm not sure to understand because so you have high level uh, transformations like J or CZ and low level ones yes. like measurements. Mm -hmm. And so is this translation you show a, a feature of the language that is you are supposed to use the high level ones and then you transform it into low level or you mix both of them or you have the uh, you have the flexibility to mix both. Uh, However, the graphical construction of the language is with the CZ and J operators. Uh, you can still compose with the measurement uh, poly corrections and entanglement as well, which is simply CZ itself. And, and uh, what are the um, transformation you allow in the classical outcomes? Any kind of uh, operations, of classical operations? 
uh, there are no operations with the classical, like modifying the classical outcomes. However, the dependent computations use the result of the measurement outcomes, which are classical. Yes, but you can do XR between classical measurements, for instance, in order to... Ah, uh, we do not. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. The, uh, some of the dependent operations are, uh, if a operation depends on multiple uh, measurement outcomes, those are XORed together. Yes. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, do you think there's some potential for putting high-level concepts in this language, which you wouldn't really have access to in the circuit model? Uh, could you give an example of what you have in mind? No, I can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it's kind of a big question. But I mean, so so the, the kind of your high-level features, to me, they seem like basically shortcuts for doing the kinds of things that you'd want to do with a circuit. Mm -hmm. uh, but in MBQC, I just wonder if there's, um, yeah, fe features that this language would allow that something like chasm wouldn't because you're in a circuit paradigm. can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, Rand, do you happen to have? No, I mean, that's the goal. And like generalized J and just being able to think in terms of cluster state computation is, we think, you know, maybe a step along the way. But, um, you know, we haven't gotten to anything that really, like, you know, gives a great intuitive sense of arbitrary quantum algorithms yeah. <laughs> program it and, and compile it down. Uh, we think this might be a starting point. It would be great if it is, but we'll have to see. So one of the original motivations for the measurement-based model was the idea that the the entangled state is generic, right? You just have the square glared cluster state and you can build everything on top of that. So do you see being given not defining the computation in terms of these J operators, but saying, okay, this is what I want to do, and I have this much cluster state and compile down to that. Is that something you foresee for the language? Uh, could you uh, explain a bit more, repeat the last part again? So the way that you've described it, you're effectively designing the cluster you're going to build mm -hmm. based on the algorithm you want to run. Yes. But if you imagine that your machine build a generic cluster state, so just a square grid cluster state, do you foresee that your compiler would be able to map the algorithm that you wrote onto the square grid automatically? That would depend on the optimizations uh, available in the like measurement calculus. And while some are available to decrease a uh, specific number, like the cluster you're using, uh, at first glance, there is no uh, straightforward way in my mind to actually uh, look at uh, exactly what clusters would be available to use for a program. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the opposite direction of my question. I will look afterwards. Okay, Thanks. yes. <laughs> All right, so let's thank the speaker again. So next up we have Robert Booth, uh, Extracting Reversible Quantum Circuits from Measurement-Based Quantum Computations with QDITS. Yeah, so this is going to be a fairly brief, uh, brisk walk through this project because it's a fairly short talk and really this would have been better as a sort of end to the talk I gave on this stuff at QPL last year, which was really the first part of this project with Seymour um, and, and that, that part of it involved Alex as well, as well as Damien Mikan and, and Jean Mignon. Um, in that talk we, we spoke uh, and, and I'll briefly overview this in the first part of the talk about um, how to generalize the measurement calculus to the setting of QDITs. Um, and in this talk, uh, we this is about ex now going, uh, so in some sense, in the other direction, taking a uh, measurement based comput computation described in that model um, and uh, extracting a circuit uh, from that. Um, now, uh, these are basically the same slides as in uh, my uh, talk this morning on uh, this stabilizer Q to Z calculus, and they're probably also the first slides from my talk. Uh, last year at QPL. Um, but very briefly, the state space for a qubit is a d-dimensional Hilbert space, or um, uh, in our case, uh, we impose that d should be a prime, and 
as always, this is because that makes the ring of arithmetic modulo d into a field. Um, and we label our uh, basis states along this uh, ring of arithmetic modulo d. Um, then to, to manipulate uh, the state of these uh, qubits, we have sort of general, fairly straightforward generalizations of the gates that you would use for the qubit setting. So we have a generalization of the Pauli gates. Uh, the Z operator acts as multiplication by a diagonal phase, which is a P of through, or in this case, a D of through of unity. Um, and the X operator is a translation through our basis states mod D. Uh, generic poly is then just any ordered product of these operations. Uh, we have a uh, connection between these two uh, representations or two bases via the Hanamide gate, which is a generalization of uh, the uh, qubit Hanamide gate and a version of the finite Fourier transform. We have a controlled Z gate, uh, which is multiplication again by a weighted sum or weighted P through to unity, weighted by uh, the uh, labels of the two qubits on which it acts. Um, and a sort of key difference from the uh, qubit case is that none of these gates are self-inverse. So the, really the point I'm trying to make with this slide is not so much what the specifics of these operators really are, but really that um, we can generalize a lot of the uh, building blocks of MBQC from the qubit second setting into the qubit setting, at least when the dimension is prime. Um, and you expect as a result that many of the constructions that we use uh, for MDQC should go forward uh, with no problem. Um, that said, there are a sort of a handful of differences that you need to take care of, and this makes it uh, a little bit more involved to reason about these things. Um, so moving straight on to the measurement calculus, I don't really have uh, enough time to go into sort of specific details, but the idea is that um, uh, in this uh, measurement calculus model of, of MBQC, um, you can show that any uh, measurement pattern or any computation can be uh, reduced to the following form, where you first initialize a bunch of qubits or qubit qubits in a, a specifically prepared state, which is a generalization of the plus state to qubits. You then do a bunch of these CZ operations to entangle uh, these uh, prepared states and some set of input states which are not in, uh, prepared. And then you perform an ordered sequence of measurements and uh, Pauli operators which are used to, to sort of correct for undesired measurement outcomes. Um, so as a result, you can associate this such a measurement pattern to a uh, decorated graph, where in this graph, the edges correspond to the CZ operations, which now, because you can apply several CZs in a row without getting identity, you need to weight the wedges, the edges with the number of uh, CZs applied. Uh, we sort of have a, a syntax for representing inputs and outputs of the computation, depending on what's measured or not, and what is prepared in this auxiliary state. Um, and then uh, a sort of key point, which is a, a, a key stumbling point, I suppose, for the extraction procedure is uh, the types of measurements that we allow at uh, a given qubit. Um, so we showed in our previous paper that it was possible to obtain um, uh, a sort of uh, family of sets of measurements. Each uh, set in this uh, family is a collection of measurements that can be used, which can be used in, in a measurement pattern and have a specific sort of predetermined corrections to them. Um, and uh, so this is just sort of a parameterization over this set for a specific choice A and B for each qubit, which determines uh, A and B belonging to the, to, the, to the finite field. And this determines uh, the sort of family of, or the set of measurements that you'd be allowed to make and that are correctable in the model. Um, so in this previous paper, we introduced ZD flow, which is a generalization of G flow. And it's, a, a, I think, a rather nice, clean, linear algebraic reformulation of G flow, which naturally generalizes to the uh, QDIT setting. Um, and the way we do it, we so in, in this article, um, we relate the adjacency matrix of the graph, which is a matrix in uh, over the finite field because of the edge weights, to a matrix which 
uh, describes the corrections, and then there is a list of, of conditions that these things need to verify uh, the, the, at the adjacency matrix and its, its product with the corrections uh, in order for the overall computation to be deterministic. Um, the sort of main result from this previous paper was that ZD flow is both a necessary and sufficient condition for a very strong form of determinism called robust determinism. Um, and we know that robustly deterministic MPQCs implement isometry, so there has to be some quantum circuit that uh, represents the or, or implements the same operation as the MPQC does. But finding such a reversible circuit is uh, not a completely straightforward task. You can sort of try and do synthesis, but this is sometimes very complicated. Um, so instead, we rely on the properties of the ZD flow. Um, now, there was a previous article by uh, John van der Wietering and Miriam Backens and Neil, I think, and someone else whose name I'm forgetting, um, where they did this for um, the case of G flow in Q qubit MBQCs. Um, and Essentially, what we're looking for is a generalization of their algorithm to the setting of, of Q to MBQCs, but there's now much more flexibility um, or, or sort of a much wider family of possible measurements which you might be doing on uh, any of your given QDITs. Now, the, the sort of main barriers, difficulties in this uh, extraction procedure is that really, uh, at, at the base of it, what we, we only really know how to extract a single gate teleportation. So uh, I've drawn the sort of MBQC in the graph picture that corresponds to a gate teleportation um, and this corresponding um, representation in terms of unitary gates. The unitary U depends on the choice of measurement that you decide to make at uh, this uh, input QDIT uh, on the left side, the right uh, QDIT is an output to the computation. Um, and we don't really know how to do any other kind of extraction. And this is problematic for two reasons. First, obviously, the connectivity of the graph is considerably simpler than some sort of an arbitrary graph that you might be working with. And secondly, uh, this extraction only works when the measurement uh, that you're doing at this input QDIT corresponds to the measurement space where the corrections are going to be just the uh, Z operator. Um, so it, when we have uh, sort of access to all the other sets in the family, um, it gets considerably more complicated. I speed up a little bit, I'm almost there. Um, now, uh, so yeah, this, the vertices are not always labeled by Z, i.e. The, the measurement space is not always the corresponding measurement space and the connectivity of the graphs is more complicated. Uh, the solution to both of these problems is to use local Clifford operations to sort of act on your graph state in order to simplify its structure. Uh, and we have two local Clifford operations or, or, uh, that preserve the uh, structure of the graph. The first is very simple, local scaling where you pick a vertex and then just multiply all of the edge weights in a neighborhood of this vertex by a fixed element of the finite field. And it's pretty easy to see that uh, this uh, well preserves the structure of the graph to a certain extent, it preserves the existence of a ZD flow, and it has a nice unitary representation, or it has a part that needs to be extracted into a circuit that doesn't appear in the graph picture. The second operation that we do is local complementation. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated, uh, it, but it essentially amounts to for you pick a vertex in your graph and look for every cone with head this vertex, then add an edge between the sort of base uh, vertices of this cone, weighted by a product of the, the, ed, the sides of the cone and the, the weight of your local complementation. Um, now, this is a little bit more uh, involved to, to show that this preserves a ZD flow, but because of this like nice uh, linear algebraic formulation that we have, uh, we can actually give a, a substantially simpler proof than in the uh, qubit setting where you sort of have to go through a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, our proof is sort of much shorter and just involves calculating matrix elements and verifying that they still verify our list of properties for the ZD flow. Now, these two operations preserve the existence of dead D-flow. They preserve the semantics of the measurement pattern uh, as long as you are you, uh, um, careful with how the uh, measurements evolve under their operation. Um, but the action is specifically of the local complementation depends on the connectivity of the graph itself. So uh, it's not necessarily completely obvious how you would do this. 
Now I only have a very uh, uh, sort of sketch of the, the extraction method. The idea is that if you have access to local cliffords, you can reduce the entirety of the uh, measurements in the graph to just either uh, measurements which need z corrections or measurements that need x corrections. Um, any, and then you know that any of the uh, vertices connected to an output are also uh, measured in the z uh, with a z correctable measurement. And these can be extracted using the, the teleportation thing. And so what we do is basically just sort of step through the graph doing sort of local Clifford operations to reduce ourselves just to this setting of, of the simplified only X or Z correctable measurements. Uh, extract the um, final uh, vertices which are measured in Z and therefore can be identified with teleportations um, and sort of eventually just uh, extract the entirety of the graph in this way. And so I have a very simple example of such a thing where I start with some graph, I do a local complementation, I identify a teleportation, I do another local complementation, I identify, uh, and then I just have uh, more teleportations and so on. Um, and so um, this is sort of more or less for me, that this is sort of completes the picture for the ZD flow stuff, but there are some open questions. Um, the extraction algorithm is sometimes very inefficient compared to what we know to be possible, uh, sort of doing things by hand. Um, there is the question of whether you can uh, do a similar version for Pauli ZD flow, which was recently shown, uh, or, or an extraction algorithm was recently found at QPR last year. Um, although I haven't found a beautiful way to do it, so I haven't done it yet. Um, and uh, there is the question also of the relation to the QDIT ZX catches that I presented this morning. There you are. Okay, any questions? Thanks, Robert. You you mentioned that the the way that you formalize um, flow in the setup is by a nice simple linear algebraic methods, yeah. simpler than the qubit case. So, if you just set d to be two, do you not? What's different than the qubit case? I mean, so the the condition is is the same, i.e., they are completely equivalent, but the presentation is different. Uh, where in the qubit case you have uh, this this function g uh, that sort of gives you uh, a set of operations and then you have to make arguments on the odd neighborhoods uh, and the, and so on of this which I, I find rather clumsy maybe people who are more used to this uh, are more comfortable with this in our case it's just a uh, purely linear algebra statement we have the adjacency matrix of the graph we multiply this by a, another matrix that has the the corrections and then we just have uh, sort of three conditions, which are uh, simply just sort of statements about the elements of the matrix that need to be verified for this to be a flow. So if you do just set d equals two, do you recover the yes, qubit yeah, result? Yeah. So it's it's actually an improvement to the qubit method yeah. to use. Your... Yeah. Yeah. It's actually uh, well, that's where this stuff came from. Actually, we were trying to think of just an easier way to present 2D G flow. And then we realized that it was parametric over the, over the field, higher dimensions. So, um, other questions? Um, yeah, so I was going to ask, so the way, so the way that we do extraction or the, or the way that uh, in this paper with John and Miriam and a bunch of other people do it, uh, as you think about doing kind of Gaussian eliminations in this kind of streaming fashion to get kind of one node out at a time. Is that still kind of the same kind of spirit of what you're doing here, or is it quite different? There is, so, you mean the there and back again paper, or the... Well, the yeah, previous. both. I mean, so the there and back again is a kind of a generalization of the, of the graph theoretic uh, paper. So, I, 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 I can't exactly remember how it works in there and back again. I think it's, it's pretty much the same, but in this paper, uh, we, I sort of, um, I, I take the whole last layer of the, um, the MBQC and pick out the vertices which are um, in the, the Z basis in the last layer. And then I show that this can be reduced in one step for something which is basically just a bunch of uh, 
kind of teleportations in one go and extract all of them in at once. Um, I, there, I, there is no explicit Gaussian elimination, as I recall, but I did do this over a year ago. So, um, but uh, it's probably implicit in I, uh, I, I sort of find fragments of the flow and adjacency matrix where their multiplication sort of diagonalizes the, uh, the adjacency matrix. Okay, yeah, that kind of sounds like the same. Yeah, I think underlying it is exactly the same, right? Okay. All right, uh, let's thank uh, the speaker again and all the speakers for the session.